Well, thanks. Um, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you today um, to, about my work on how epithelial tissues um, guarantee folding. Um, and so uh, what I'm interested in is how is complex 3D shape established during development? Um, and namely, how do you go from a single cell or sphere, um, spherical shape into a multicellular organism that's comprised of many intricate structures? Um, and this process of morphogenesis necessitates the coordinated movement and deformation of huge populations of cells. Um, and what I'm interested in is the physics of how simple interaction rules between cells inside tissues can drive the necessary shape changes um, in a mechanical way um, to drive to build 3D shape robustly. So um, tissues can build shape in many different ways, including, for example, budding or branching. But one really common strategy that tissues use um, to build 3D shape across organisms and in many different contexts is the process of tissue folding. Um, and so as you can see here, um, three different examples of 2D cell sheets that bend and fold um, in the zebrafish, mouse, and fruit fly um, to build really um, diverse structures. So the optic cup, which is going to later go on and form the eye, the neural tube, which forms um, the central nervous system in the mouse, um, and this fold in the fruit fly, the ventral furrow, um, which internalizes a group of cells in the early embryo into the center of the embryo. And these cells are gonna later go on and form the muscle. Um, and this fruit fly ventral furrow fold is what I'll be talking about um, throughout my talk. Um, so what's important um, when tissues fold is not just that they can fold, um, but that there's a high um, spatial and temporal control of where folds form during development to achieve a target shape. Um, and so this is simply as illustrated here with the folding of a dollar bill. Um, it's important that we position and time our folds correctly um, during the sort of origami steps if we're trying to build um, an ele a folded elephant to avoid accidentally um, finding ourselves with an origami pig. Um, so similarly, during development, um, the question is, what actually um, defines where folds form? Um, and so in other words, how do cells know where they are and, and what they should go on and do? Um, and so I'll, I'll show you an example of this to answer this question um, using, again, this early fruit fly embryo. Um, so the early fruit fly embryo um, is a sort of a football shaped um, embryo, uh, a football shape. And here we're looking at a cross section of this football um, and this, a single epithelial sheet surrounding a central yolk. Um, so what determines which side of this um, uh, embryo is gonna go on and fold this, form this initial fold? Um, so the classical developmental biology description of how shape change events are positioned and controlled centers around morphogens and pattern gene expression. Um, so a morphogen is a signaling molecule whose non-uniform distribution conveys positional information to cells inside a tissue, um, and then can spatially modulate gene expression at locations where the morphogen is present um, at certain levels. And so what this does, as you can see in the bottom row, is that the presence of a morphogen defines um, the, where certain genes are gonna get turned on at the location of the future fold. Um, this pattern gene expression induces signal transduction and recruits cytoskeletal proteins to the position where the fold should form, um, which results in force generation and cell constriction at the right location. Um, and so while um, this answers where does a fold form, um, it's really um, this sort of picture really only delivers static snapshots of where cells are getting specific spatial cues through morphogens and pattern gene expression. Um, but a, a gap in our understanding um, and a place right now where I think physics is um, providing a lot of contributions to developmental biology is how do we go from these precise patterns um, of gene expression to global movements and deformations that are needed to build shape in a developing tissue. Um, and this is really um, sort of a part of this flow chart that I'm interested in, um, which is how do folds form um, specifically through um, collective movements inside tissues. 
Um, and within that, something that I'm particularly interested in is not just how folds can form, but this question of how can folds form in a very robust manner. So um, if you have a bunch of, for example, early fruit fly embryos, almost all of them are gonna be able to fold correctly. Um, um, and so for able and um, foreign developing tissue to develop um, and form its correct final shape, um, it has to be very robust to different types of perturbations that are present in biological systems. So you can imagine there are mechanical perturbations, genetic mutations, um, or other types of stochastic events. Um, and while work has, a lot of work has been done on understanding how robustness is achieved at the genetic or protein level, um, for example, through multiple proteins that can kind of code for the same function, it's still poorly understood how mechanically tissues are able to respond to different types of perturbations. Um, so for example, damage or loss of um, cell loss and adapt the pattern of forces in the remaining cells um, inside the tissue to still achieve the correct movements and synchrony in the tissue required to um, build correct tissue shape. So one way to, um, sorry, to um, form robust collective patterns is through simple interactions between moving individuals. Um, and this has been studied a lot in the field of um, active matter physics, um, where similar physical models can be used um, to describe the emergent um, patterns in, for example, schools of fish um, or flocks of sheep um, by introducing simple ways in which each unit in the system interacts and aligns with its neighbors. And these have also been used to describe, for example, these beautiful swirling patterns that we see um, with cells plated on a flat dish. Um, but I would I'd like to highlight is that in all of these cases that these systems don't require a specific leader to tell the others what to do, um, but rather these patterns really emerge because of these interactions between individuals. So for example, a predator can come in and eat a bunch of fish or sheep and the remaining um, units in the system are still gonna be able to form these um, robust um, patterns that we're seeing. So what I'm interested in is um, can similarly mechanical interactions between cells inside a tissue explain um, robust morphogenesis during development? Um, and this gets to what I'll be showing you where I'll be talking about how cell interactions in this early fruit fly embryo robustly established tissue curvature. Um, so I've already showed you um, a fair amount about this system, but I'll just um, want to say that the early fruit fly embryo is an ideal model system to study um, folding and how that occurs robustly because it's relatively simple tissue fold um, without any complicating factors like cell division or simultaneous movements of other tissues in the embryo, because at this point, we just have a single epithelial sheet surrounding a central yolk. Um, and what we know is that this tissue fold is driven um, through by apical constriction, um, which basically is the constriction of the apical side of a group of cells, um, which are pointing outward with respect to their basal or bottom surface. So um, about a group of around a thousand cells on the um, ventral side of the embryo start to undergo apical constriction during about three hours into development. And as these cells constrict their top surface, they become increasingly wedge-like, and that triggers the um, bending of the tissue um, and the internalization of this group of cells into the inside of the embryo. Um, what we know is that this constriction of the apical surface of the cells is driven by the motor protein myosin, um, which when it's in its active conformation organizes um, into many filaments with motor heads pointing outward. Um, and these motor heads walk along anti-parallel um, F-actin filaments, um, causing them to slide with respect to each other and introducing a force. Um, sorry. Um, so at the scale of a single cell apex here, we're looking down at the surface of the cell, um, myosin pulls on the an actin meshwork that's present across the surface of the cell and results and triggers it to constrict um, its surface area. Now, if we look up at uh, one scale higher, at a few cells inside this tissue, which is constricting. Um, interestingly, what we see is that leading up to tissue folding, um, myosin doesn't just accumulate across the entire cell or in the center, but it actually starts to form um, these sort of filamentous 
um, link um, fibers across the cell apex that link cross cell cell junctions with um, filamentous structure in neighboring cells. Um, and so you can see this in the bottom left panel where group myosin is in green and these white arrowheads show how myosin is linking with these sort of filamentous structure of myosin in neighboring cells across cell cell junctions in magenta. Um, I wanna say that the myosin itself can't flow between neighboring cells, um, but it forms what looks like sort of these supracellular structures, um, sort of continuous looking fibers across the cell cell junction, um, which are basically these mechanical connection linking between some subset of cells in the tissue, which is gonna go on and constrict. Um, and so here, if we look up one scale further, now we're looking down at the ventral side of the embryo, and then we can see this beautiful supracellular myosin network, which is what I'll be calling these linkages, um, that forms across the embryo, connecting a subset of these cells together um, just prior to tissue folding. Um, and so this uh, network of connections that forms across the tissue um, got me very interested um, because in general, I was sort of interested in how collective properties emerge inside tissues. Um, and what I was wondering is, does these patterns of linkages between cells inside the tissue um, help control this collective um, movement and folding of the tissue itself? And could the architecture of the network somehow encode tissue's ability to change shape in a robust manner? Um, but the challenge here was how do we quantify this supracellular network across you know, around a thousand cells and over developmental time? Um, because we're looking at you know, subcellular localization of myosin um, at the tissue scale and our confocal images were very noisy as you can imagine. Um, and so to overcome this challenge, what I did is that I um, adapted um, an algorithm that was used to trace highly noisy filamentous structure in astronomical data to trace um, this highly noisy filamentous structure in the myosin signal. Um, and what it does is it uses a topological smoothing um, to and outputs um, basically a network representation of our myosin signal. Um, and so I think this is kind of can be illustrated here on the left where this heat map is a myosin intensity that we um, can get from our images. Um, and this network um, trace um, defines the nodes in the network as local peaks in our maxima, in our myosin signal. Um, so local maxima and then the edges in the network correspond to the topological ridges that connect um, these peaks and um, peaks together. So it's like um, peaks and, and then the mountain range that connects, connects them together. And so this was exciting because now we were able to have a full trace of our myosin structure across a tissue and over developmental time. And we could start asking um, what, how is it structured and how does that structure evolve and maybe affect folding itself? Um, so the first thing we did is mapped out the connections and asked if there was any um, preferential orientation um, of the network. And so what I'm showing you here is one example of a wild type network um, just prior to tissue folding, um, where all the edges in the network are color coded um, with respect to their orientation. And what we saw is that there was a preferential um, bias in the network where there were more um, anterior posterior edges compared to dorsal ventral edges. So more edges in the network aligned with the parallel to the direction of the fold. Um, and so what I, we wanted to know is what sets up this bias in the network and could it be related to tissue geometry? Um, so to test that, what we did is that we used a mutant that expands the number of cells, the ventral region in the tissue. So the number of cells that are gonna recruit myosin apically and try and interconnect together. Um, and so instead of having a very um, is an isotropic um, domain, you end up with more of a square um, domain of um, cells that are expressing myosin. And indeed, when we change the geometry of the network, um, cells that are interconnecting to the network, um, we lost the orientation bias that we were seeing um, in edge orientation. Um, and then strikingly, when we looked at how this mutant folded, what we saw is that instead of folding along the long axis of the embryo, the fold actually um, formed in the perpendicular direction, which um, you know, is devastating for the embryo because you're internalizing the wrong cells and this is not gonna be a viable um, embryo going forward. 
So we see here is that network orientation impacts tissue folding. Um, so what we wanted to know then is how the, are robust mechanics ensured during morphogenesis? Um, and so when thinking about what makes um, something robust to perturbation and specifically a network robust to perturbation, um, I started thinking about networks in general and um, what allows them to be resilient to damage. Um, and so here I'm just showing you three uh, other types of networks. There's, there's subway networks. Um, and you can sort of think intuitively that um, redundancy is highly important in all types of networks to ensure that um, the overall system is resilient to localized damage. So as you can imagine, you wanna have many backup paths, for example, in your subway system, so that if one station gets damaged, trains can kind of bypass that damage and still the, the system overall can still function. Um, so is that a strategy that the embryo uses? Um, one way to quantify the um, redundancy in your network um, is through a measure called between the centrality. Um, and so what that does is it's a measure that you can use or quantify, you can quantify for every node in your network. And it measures the number of times a node is used on the shortest path to connect pairs of two, any two other nodes together. So what that means is like, for example, node B is used to connect A and C together on the shortest path between them, A and E and so on. And so if a node has a high between a centrality, what that's telling you is that it's basically very important um, to interconnect other regions of your network together. So if we look here again at our subway network, what I'm showing you is the in yellow is the three um, there's the node in each network that has the highest between the centrality. So it's basically the most important station in your subway network to interconnect other regions together. And what you might notice is that um, in New York and Paris, even the most important station has a relatively low between a centrality compared to, for example, Boston, um, um, Barston's Park Street station. And so what that means is that basically a Park Street gets, has a problem or a stalled train, then basically none of the other system uh, is gonna work and it's a very poorly engineered um, architecture of this train system. Um, so what you want is to have low between a centrality everywhere to increase your network's resilience to damage. Um, so what does that look like for us in the, in the embryo? Um, here, what I'm showing you is the wild type network um, where I'm color coding each node in this network, um, which is just prior to tissue folding with its between a centrality value. Um, and what we saw is that the between a centrality inside the network was relatively low, uh, meaning that there were many redundant paths across connecting across the network. Um, but what's maybe a better way of representing this is we can take for each time point. So for example, here, we can average all the between a centrality of all the nodes and see how that um, average between a centrality at a certain time point evolves over time. Um, so this is what I'm plotting here. And each green color is just a different wild type. And we see that the average between a centrality in the embryo decreases leading up to T equals zero or tissue folding meaning that prior to folding, the redundancy is increasing um, in your system. And because these values sort of all converge towards a similar um, amount of redundancy, um, I was interested in, um, is there anything important about this level of redundancy to actually trigger tissue folding? Um, so to answer this, I use two different types of perturbations. Um, first, uh, genetic degradation of myosin by overexpressing myosin phosphatase. Um, and you can get a range of phenotypes that have um, a different uh, networks of different sizes, um, down to networks that were around 35% of the original wild type length. And in all of these different um, degraded networks, what we saw is that um, the overall importance of the nodes remaining in the network increased, but some minimal connectivity was still able to be found across the tissue um, and the embryos still folded correctly. Um, the second um, perturbation that I did is that um, you could ablate different regions inside your tissue, basically deactivating certain cells and they don't recruit uh, myosin apically and are unable to interconnect into a network. Um, and I was able to create large um, sort of holes in the network up to 32 cell sizes. Um, 
And what I saw is even in these large, um, these networks with huge holes in them, um, there was still some minimal connectivity that was able to form across the network, across the tissue. Um, and these embryos still went on to fold. Um, and strikingly, I followed them all the way up to hatching out into larva. Um, and so this, these were completely viable embryos um, through development. Um, so what we interestingly see is that while I would have, the wild type um, embryo forms many more linkages than is minimally needed for the tissue to fold. Um, and while initially I thought this was striking because maybe it costs a lot of energy to do so, what it does is that it encodes this intrinsic robustness into your system where large regions of the network can get damaged um, using different, um, in different ways and the tissue still goes on um, to fold and isn't um, perturbed by them. Um, but interestingly, I don't have time to show here, but if you do vertical cuts and sever all um, anterior posterior paths across the embryo, the tissue itself is unable to fold, suggesting that there's maybe some minimal amount of anterior posterior connectivity that is required. So if it's not redundancy that's important in triggering folding, um, then what in fact does trigger the tissue to start to fold? And so what I hypothesize is that maybe there needs to be some amount of stress that builds in, up in the network to trigger folding. So if the edges inside your network, for example, get pulled taut, um, then cells might um, be, be connected by rigid, something that's more rigid, like a rigid rod. And this might um, cause the movement of neighboring cells to become increasingly correlated um, and trigger this sort of collective correlated movement as when all the cells start to flow towards the middle, midline of the fold and internalize. Anna, um, and, about three minutes left. Yeah. Um, and so one way to measure if this network is getting pulled taut is by look at the straightness of your edge. Um, and you can measure this by um, the tortuosity, which is the length along your edge divided by um, the distance between the two endpoints. So if the network is getting very taut, your tortuosity should go towards one, which would be your edge is completely straight. Um, and indeed here, if we plot the average tortuosity in wild type networks over time, we saw that the network itself was getting pulled straight prior to t equals zero when the fold begins. Um, and similarly, when we can looked at how the straightness of the network edges evolved in mutants and the perturbations we did, we saw similarly that the network gets pulled straight before tissue folding initiates. Um, so to better understand what mechanical function um, these sort of taut stiff edges could be playing um, to promote um, tissue folding, we collaborated with Pearson Miller and Jorn Dunkel at the MIT math department um, to build an elastic shell model of the embryo. Um, and so what the model was is that the embryo itself was modeled in this elastic shell um, and this ventral um, myosin contractility patch that we see in experiments was modeled um, by um, varying the preferred curvature of the shell um, on, in this rectangular myosin patch on the surface, on its surface. And so as you increase the preferred curvature of the shell in that region, it's gonna trigger the shell to bend inward. But then on top of that, what we did is we added um, and imposed a, a network of stiff elements on the surface of the embryo, which were modeled from our data. Uh, and these stiff edges, added an additional energy cost um, for the tissue to bend along the length of the edge and instead is, promotes the bending of the shell um, perpendicular to the network length, not, not the edge direction. Um, so what does that look like? So first, if you just um, modulate the contractility in that ventral patch on the shell without having a network imposed on top, what you can see is that you in, as you increase contractility, the shell goes from a dimpled um, uh, conformation to a, a fold similar to what you see in experiment. Um, but then uh, when we imposed this stiff uh, network on top of our shell, what we saw is that um, the shell was actually able to fold um, and at, at a lower degree of myosin contractility, um, suggesting that the presence of this stiff network on our embryo actually ensures robust folding at a wider range of contractility levels. Um, so just to conclude, what we see here is that um, in the early embryo, there's two parallel strategies that encode intrinsic robustness via cell interactions. Um, first, there's redundant um, C in the myosin network. Um, and then also the presence of these stiff oriented fibers 
on the surface of the embryo that play a structural role in guiding um, folding. And, and what I just think is interesting here is that because these um, strategies are intrinsic inside the embryo, it allows the embryo to react immediately to insults um, and sort of keep the development on this correct um, timing and path without having to wait for a wound healing response. Um, and so this shows that understanding the pattern of cell interactions is critical to interpreting tissue level behavior. And in the hope in the future is can we learn how to pattern stresses and connectivity inside a tissue um, to, pat to fold any 3D shape at will or maybe even fold a 3D shape and then reassemble it into another shape. Um, and clearly this is important when thinking about reprogramming the shape of developmentally defective tissues um, or even for engineering self-folding soft materials that are robust to perturbation. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank Adam Martin, uh, my mentor at MIT, um, collaborators Jorn Dunkel and Pearson Miller, um, and then thank you so much for your attention. And then since I have you, I just wanna make a shameless plug that um, I'll be starting my lab at Brandeis in 2022. So if anybody's interested um, in the physics of development or the robustness and living systems, um, I have openings for grad students and postdocs. So I'd love to chat. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hannah, for that fantastic talk. There's several questions in the chat. I think we can get to a couple before the informal uh, session. Um, so I'll ask one here from Ahmad Borzu. Um, given that tissue folding is dynamical, how do you incorporate dynamics into the network model? Yeah, so that's really interesting um, challenge. That was something that I initially started looking at um, when I was doing this project because um, between time points, the network is actually reorganizing a huge amount. Um, and so while you see some average properties um, you know, clearly changing with a you know clean trend over time. So, for example, it's becoming more redundant, or for example, the node degree is increasing. So each node is connecting with more of its neighbors. Um, the actual edges themselves are not very stable, and it's sort of constantly evolving. Um, I don't have a great way right now to say how I incorporate that. Um, I think it's something I've been thinking about a lot. But I I just one thought is that. It also, the dynamics is sort of something that also helps, I think, the embryo encode some sort of intrinsic robustness because what it means is that no specific location inside your tissue is, is like ever too important because sort of the regions of high connectivity are constantly getting shuffled around spatially and changing, um, which I think is sort of an interesting idea. Um, but yeah, that's sort of like a for the future, I think. <laughs> 